Well, good evening, friends, and uh, welcome to our 7 o'clock live Bible study. This is the Wednesday night version of week number two. I hope everybody had a wonderful day today. It's good to, to have you here with us as we go through and continue our journey through uh, the Gospel of John. Uh, tonight we'll be looking at John chapter 3, verses 9 uh, through 15. We are still in, in the middle of a discussion between Nicodemus and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that took place uh, in the evening. Uh, just by way of a recap, on Monday night we talked about the fact that this conversation that Jesus and Nicodemus are entering into on Monday night, um, we discussed how there was going to need to be a change to be able to see and enter the kingdom of God. That change that Jesus tells us we need to make is to be uh, born from above, or we sometimes refer to as being born again. And Monday night we talked about the distinction between justification uh, or being saved through our faith in Jesus Christ or what God does for us with being born again or, or what occurs, what God does inside of us uh, as we uh, you know, are born again or born anew, born from above with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then last night we talked about the distinction and some of the questions that Nicodemus was asking Jesus. Um, good questions, truthfully, because we talked about needing to give Nicodemus a little bit of a pass here that nobody had ever known what Jesus was talking about about this need to be born again. When you were uh, <clears throat> a part of, of the Jewish culture, you're either born a Jew, you're not born a Jew. There was no changing who you were uh, during the course of your lifetime. And so when Jesus says you need to be born again, Nicodemus thinks of it being as another physical birth, whereas Jesus is trying to set his mind on more uh, heavenly things. We talked about last night, again, the need for us to change uh, from inside out instead of being washed uh, on the outside, be washed on the inside uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So tonight we're going to continue on uh, with this discussion that Nicodemus and uh, Jesus uh, are, are having with each other. We'll cover John chapter 3 verses 9 through 15 tonight. But like we always want to do, we want to begin our time together with a word of prayer. So I want to invite you to join me as we bow our heads and close our eyes and let us pray. Heavenly Father, I praise and thank you that in Christ your church has been set free from sin and death. Like the Israelites who brought you out of Egypt, you have broken the bars of our yoke and enabled us to walk with heads held high as your sons and daughters. I pray tonight for my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, for myself, Lord, that our hearts will become a place where the mystery of the truth that we have been set free from sin can take root, define us, and produce change in us. Remove from our lives, I pray, every yoke of slavery, Wake us up to all the ways that we are allowing the enemy to whisper in our ears and define our living by our past instead of the present victory of the cross. Destroy his lies, I pray. May we increasingly have ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us. May our hearts be defined by the truth of your word. May our lives be a consistent expression of walking in the grace, forgiveness, and freedom that we have received. Set us free from condemnation, I pray. Remove shame, regret, and all evidence of guilt from our lives. Forgive us for living as if we are still slaves to sin. O oh God, strengthen us to walk in victory. May my life and the lives of my brothers and sisters be marked by the glorious truth that our sin has been taken away, wiped from your memory. Our debt has been paid. Hallelujah. Infuse our lives, I pray, with great joy in this amazing truth. Christ Jesus has set us free. May we as a faith community be redefined by the work of Christ on our behalf and may the truth of your word renew our minds and thoughts. Strengthen us to turn from self-focused living and fix our eyes on Jesus once again that we might walk in the freedom he has provided. We ask these things in the name of Jesus who came to set the captives free and whose name we say, Amen. All right, so again tonight we're going to focus in on John chapter 3 verses 9 through, through 15. But before I get there, I want to go back and read a little bit from the Old Testament book of Numbers because Jesus is going to mention something here that's important for us to kind of have a, a working knowledge about. Now, the book of Numbers, uh, you know, of course, is one of those books I think we don't spend a whole lot of time on in the church. This is the point. If you ever try to do a read a Bible in a year, by the time you get to Numbers, your eyes kind of glaze over and you run through it. 
But there are important stories in the book of Numbers, particularly the one we want to talk about tonight as it relates to Jesus' conversation that he is having with Nicodemus. Now, to kind of set the stage here, this is the time after the, the um, Israelites have been freed uh, from Egypt. And they're with Moses, and they're walking through the wilderness, and they've already been through uh, one war. Uh, they've, they've come across a second war. They've emerged victorious, but they're continuing to wander in the wilderness. And now the people of Israel are starting to complain. They're complaining to Moses about the manna. It's, it's the same thing day after day. Why can't we just go back to Egypt? Where are you taking us, Moses? Complain, 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 complain. Well, now the Israelites are starting to turn their complaining against Moses towards complaining against the Lord. So here we would pick up here. This is uh, Numbers chapter 21, starting in verse 4. It says, From Mount Or they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. Right? The Israelites became impatient. The people spoke up against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. So to sum up, the people of Israel were living in ways that God did not approve of. And so he sent punishment to them. The people then prayed to Moses to intercede on their behalf to save them. So God says, make a serpent out of bronze, or make a serpent, put it on a pole, hold it up. And these people who have been bitten by the serpent can look upon or look up toward the serpent on a pole, and whoever looks or sets their gaze upon it will be saved. All right? So we'll hit pause there. Now we'll get to our reading tonight from John chapter 3, 9 through 15. By the time we get there, hopefully you'll understand why I wanted to read that part for you before we got here. So this is John chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. And then this is still Nicodemus and Jesus having a midnight conversation. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. Again, Jesus just said you have to be born again to see and walk in the kingdom of heaven. How can this be? You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know. And we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. All right, Dr. Witherington then tells us this. It says, The dialogue takes an interesting turn when an incredulous Nicodemus asks, How can this be? And Jesus responds, You are Israel's teacher, and do you not understand these things? Jesus will go on to suggest that he has been speaking of earthly things thus far and suggest that if he were to go on to more advanced or heavenly topics, Nicodemus' credulity would be stretched to the breaking point. Interestingly, Jesus says that he speaks of things that he has seen as well as known. This suggests he is referring to some conversations that may have already happened during the early days of his ministry. Once we get toward the end of the Gospel of John, John writes that there are many things uh, that Jesus did and said that aren't included in the gospel. So again, we're to, to make an inference here, just like we did last week when we inferred that Mary must have known that Jesus could work miracles before he worked his first miracle at the wedding at Cana. So here there must have been conversations before this one between Nicodemus and Jesus. Notice as well that Jesus groups Nicodemus with, quote, you people, unquote, who don't accept his testimony. Later we learn in John chapter 20 that Nicodemus continued to be a sympathizer with Jesus even after his crucifixion. 
Here in two important points need to be made about verse 11. And verse 11 is where Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. The first point is that Jesus punctuates his key sayings by introducing them with Amen, Amen, which is translated here as very truly. Normally, Amen is the response of someone else to something that a teacher or a prophet has said that sounds true, just as we use the word Amen today in response to some preachers. But Jesus is amening his own teaching, affirming the truthfulness of his own testimony. This is something unique about Jesus and his style of teaching, and it tells us that he does not think his words need independent confirmation, not even the testimony of two witnesses as the law suggested. So roughly Jesus is saying, well, because I said it, you can take it to the bank, and my word is, is good. Notice as well that Jesus uses only one amen in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to introduce his key sayings, but in John, he always uses two. Whenever we read it saying very truly or truly I say to you, in the Greek it actually would be amen, amen, before Jesus starts into his point. The second point is that in the fourth gospel there are regular references to the Jews, which in fact refers to a certain group of Jews, the Jewish leaders who frequently were doubters about the authenticity of Jesus and his teaching. Here these same folks seem to be called you people, not all the people or not all the Jews. The Gospel of John is not an anti-Semitic document blaming all Jews for rejecting Jesus or for his death. One has to do a careful contextual study of phrases like the Jews in this Gospel as the phrase is used differently in different parts. What he's saying here is when the evangelist refers to or Jesus refers to folks as the Jews, he's speaking about a very specific and certain sect of that particular culture. Not all of them. Not everybody. He's not painting with a broad brush. He's very specific in who he is pointing out. Verse 13 brings up one of the keys to understanding Jesus in this gospel, namely, namely knowing where the Son of Man came from and also where he is going. It is precisely because people do not know that Jesus came from God that they lack understanding of his identity. Thus, for example, when someone assumes Jesus ultimately comes from Nazareth, the question follows quite naturally, how can anything good much less messianic, come from there. Later in this gospel, the disciples struggle to understand Jesus when he says he must go away for a while. In this gospel, the Son has come from God and will return to God, and this tells us a great deal about who he actually is. So again, we talked about last night when Jesus compares the Holy Spirit with the wind, saying we don't usually know where the wind is coming from, we don't know where the wind is going, but we can always see what happens, the after effects of the wind, here, a lot of people didn't understand that Jesus came from heaven and is returning to heaven when his earthly ministry is over. And that's what causes a lot of confusion as to Jesus' true identity as the Son of God. But bit by bit, he's trying to get Nicodemus on board and trying to teach Nicodemus exactly who Jesus is and what Nicodemus needs to do to not only see but inherit the kingdom of God. A few things I found out today as I was doing some some research I want to bring to your attention here. It says that Jesus can speak authoritatively about the heavenly subject of rebirth because he is the Son of Man from heaven. The ultimate purpose of Jesus' coming is to be lifted up as a source of healing and life like the serpent in the wilderness. Let me read that again. The ultimate purpose of Jesus' coming is to be lifted up as a source of healing and life just like the serpent in the wilderness that we read about in the Old Testament book of Numbers. This phrase, lifted up, has two senses. One, being lifted up on the cross, but also two, is being exalted. To be born again from above means receiving life in the Spirit through the life-giving death of Jesus Christ. And this here, Christ now illustrates from Numbers 21 the nature of God's plan of redemption. Sin had caused God to punish the Israelites with serpents. God commanded Moses to make a brass serpent so that when the sick looked to that serpent, they would be healed. The Son of Man must be lifted up on the cross so that man bitten by the serpent of sin might look upon him and have life eternal. What do you think about that? So just like in Numbers, 
when God told Moses to make the serpent and hold it up so those who have been bitten because of their sin can look upon the serpent and be saved, so similarly Christ has to be lifted up so that we, bitten by our own sinful natures, can look upon him to be saved. That's why Jesus mentions it here, mentions it here to Nicodemus. Because understand, as a, a leader in the Jewish nation, the Jewish, Jewish synagogues, Nicodemus knows all about those Old Testament stories, what we refer to as the Old Testament, what they were referred to as the Scriptures. Nicodemus knows all about it, right? And so when Jesus, Jesus is trying to get on his level and say, here's what I'm talking about. You don't understand me when I talk about being born again. You don't understand what I'm talking about, about being born from above. You don't understand when I talk about the Spirit, uh, you know, coming, not knowing where it's coming from, where it's going to. You certainly don't understand that I'm the Son of God. Maybe you understand about this serpent that we read about for the ancient Israelites as they wandered in the wilderness. I want to read this too. It's kind of long, but bear with me because it is it's good. It says, in response to Nicodemus' confusion, Jesus gently taunts the teacher for his lack of understanding. If the teachers of Israel cannot make sense of Jesus' life and message, what will happen to those that they teach? In verse 11, the pronouns shift to plurals from we and you all, suggesting that Jesus is speaking as the head of all believers and that Nicodemus represents a larger group of people who come to Jesus yet struggle with his teaching. Introducing a key term for the rest of the chapter, to believe, Jesus speaks of Nicodemus' failure to believe earthly things. If Nicodemus can't understand these earthly workings of the Spirit, how will he understand the heavenly things, such as Jesus' ascent to and descent from heaven? Nicodemus stands at a crossroads. Will he be one of Jesus' own who does not receive him, or one of the many Jews who come to believe in Jesus? Verse 14 is another bifocal passage looking back to a famous Old Testament story of salvation and forward to Jesus' crucifixion. Alluding to a story from the book of Numbers, Jesus says he will be lifted up like the serpent of old in order to save his people. The Greek word for lifted up is humpsoo, can also mean exalted. And this double meaning is the point. Jesus will literally be lifted up on a cross. But this brutal lifting up is actually his exaltation and return to the Father. Those who looked to the serpent in Numbers were spared their physical lives. Those who look to Jesus will have eternal life. In verse or chapter 3, verse 15, we find John's first reference to a central theme in this gospel, eternal life. To have eternal life is to know and be in relationship with the Father through the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. It is to be born from above or born of the Spirit. Eternal life is presented throughout this gospel as a present tense reality of the believer in Christ. Three important qualifications need to be made. First, eternal life was only a possibility after Jesus' death and the giving of the Spirit. Second, eternal life is in the present does not diminish the hope of eternal life in the resurrection. And third, one can walk away from the eternal life Christ offers. Eternal life is not eternal security. All right, so there we'll, we'll kind of bring to a close the you know, the, the looking into the exegesis portion of, of the story. I hope you kind of get an idea of exactly why it's important to look at Scripture not as just two different books, not just as an Old Testament and a, and a, and a New Testament, that it is one story that represents from Genesis to Revelation God's plan for us to have abundant life. And we read it as one work, as, as one, uh, one story, then it makes sense that Jesus would reach back into uh, the Jewish ancestry and say, listen, maybe you understand about this you don't understand what I'm trying to tell you about being born again, and maybe you will understand when if I uh, apply one of the stories from old about Moses and the serpent and how I also must be lifted up to save everybody and give them eternal life. So interesting conversation here, I think, taking place between Nicodemus and Jesus. I want to close with a devotion uh, that ties right into the same verses that we, we read tonight. I want you to listen to this. Every time we close in a devotion like this, I pick the ones we read because I think it, it challenges us and forces us to, to re-examine our own walk with Christ, our own lives, and see exactly where we may be. Because understand, we're going to screw it up just about every day. At least I know that I typically do. But thanks be to God that you are given a chance to repent of the ways that you screwed up and try again the next day. Because God's love, grace, and mercy refreshes and renews each and every day that you wake up. 
so long as you are determined to live a life that Christ intends for you to live, yeah, we're going to screw up. But we have a loving Father who's never going to be so far gone from us that he won't come back running to us and say, okay, well, here you go. Let's try it again. He'll pick you up and, and help you to try again. But listen to this devotion and see what it, what it might stir inside of you uh, this evening. It says that by being lifted up, our Lord meant nothing less than his own death upon the cross. That death, he would have us know, was appointed by God to be the life of the world. It was ordained from all eternity to be the great propitiation and satisfaction for man's sin. It was the payment by an almighty substitute and representative of man's enormous debt to God. When Christ died upon the cross, our many sins were laid upon him. He was made sin for us. He was made a curse for us. By his death, he purchased pardon and complete redemption for all sinners. The brazen serpent lifted up in the camp of Israel brought health and cure within the reach of all who were bitten by serpents. Christ crucified in like manner brought eternal life within reach of lost mankind. Christ has been lifted up on the cross and man looking to him for by faith may be saved. The truth before us is the very foundation stone of the Christian religion. Christ's death is the Christian's life. Christ's cross is the Christian's title to heaven. Christ's lifted up and put to shame on Calvary is the ladder by which Christians enter into the holiest and are at length landed in glory. It is true that we are sinners, but Christ suffered for us. It is true that we deserve death, but Christ has died for us. It is true that we are great debtors, but Christ has paid our debts with his own blood. This is the real gospel. This is the good news. On this, let us lean while we live. To this, let us cling when we die. Christ has been lifted up on the cross and has thrown open the gates of heaven to all believers. Amen and amen. It says at the bottom, the serpent on the pole gave life but suffered nothing. Bronze does not feel pain. Our Savior gave a better life, but at terrible personal cost. As with most things, the analogies to the two stories can only go so far, but I do think it is, is worth revisiting tonight how the story from the book of Numbers matches up and why Jesus used it during his conversation with Nicodemus. All right, friends, that will bring us to a close on this Wednesday night. Uh, if you missed any of tonight, came in late, that's fine. It's going to be saved here on the Facebook page here in just a bit. I'll also load it up and save it on my YouTube channel so that you can go back and watch it at any time that's, a conven that's convenient for you. If you missed anything we've done so far this week, anything we done la did last week, anything we've done ever since we've been doing these online Bible studies together, they're all loaded on the YouTube page. There are different playlists for the different studies we've gone through. I urge you to take a look at, at each and every one of those. Again, the pattern is, is going to be the same for as long as we want to keep it going. We're going to be live at 7 o'clock Monday through Friday. And then on Saturday will be a summation video loaded up. that will not only be me, but also be uh, Dr. Ben Witherington III from Asbury, who's leading this or who wrote this particular study uh, that we're going through. So having said that, we're going to close in prayer here in just a minute. Uh, but I want to say thanks to everybody who joined us tonight. I hope you guys have a restful night's sleep tonight. I hope you have a wonderful Thursday. And I hope to see you back here again tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. But until then... Let us all bow our heads and close our eyes and go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. O oh, merciful Father, you look on the weaknesses, weaknesses of your human children more in pity than in anger and more in love than in pity. Help me now in your holy presence to examine the secrets of my heart. Have I done anything today to fulfill the purposes for which you have brought me into the world? Have I accepted the opportunities of service that in your wisdom you have put before me? Have I performed the duties of the day without leaving any undone? Give me grace to answer honestly, Lord. Have I done anything today to damage the Christian ideal of true humanity? Have I been lazy in body or listless in spirit? Have I overindulged my bodily appetites? Have I kept my imagination pure and healthy? Have I been scrupulously honorable in all my dealings? 
Have I been transparently sincere in all that I have claimed to be, to feel, or to do? Give me grace to answer honestly, Lord. Have I tried today to see myself as others see me? Have I made more excuses for myself than I have been willing to make for others? Have I been a peacemaker in my own home or have I stirred up trouble? Have I, while professing noble convictions for great causes, failed even in common charity and courtesy toward those nearest to me? Give me grace to answer honestly, Lord. Lord, it is only your infinite love demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ which has the power to destroy the empire of evil in my heart. Grant that with each day that passes, I may more and more be delivered from the sins that keep tempting me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, my friends. So I will hopefully see you back here tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Until then, have a great night, a great Thursday, and God bless.